to, to say to you, yes, we can do that. I don't have a mandate to do something like that. That would be the best thing you could do. I'm just saying yeah. okay. to stop holding uh, Thank you. Just before we conclude, and this is the last contribution because we have the League of Credit Unions. Just, just there was something that came up earlier on. It was in relation to credit ratings, and I think it leads into Deputy Wallace as well. Like, Another part of freeing up the funds is access to credit. Equity is just one part of it, but also a, a person cannot access credit if their credit rating has been blemished in the past because it sits with them for an X number of years. So that's something else we need to look at, particularly from the, for the build, Building Federation and for building industry to go forward. They're sitting there with credit ratings that have been affected. So in actual fact, that's tying them up as well for not being able to access credit. Uh, Mr. Brett, do you want to yeah, I might ask Morris just Mark. to cover that, Mr. Crowley. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one, obviously, um, because a bank and making the new loan is going to be influenced by the experience of the past, and yeah. the experience of the past was caused by a range of factors. There was no one single factor. So uh, it's certainly something we can discuss with the members, it's, but I, it's challenging because an awful lot of bank lending is done on a track record, it's done on affordability, it's done on the ability to pay rent going back. So it's... It colours the credit decision, and there's no, there's no getting over that. Just on your point there, uh, it should be pointed out that uh, not only do the builders become developer, uh, did, did they, uh, for want of a better word, fuck up, but so did the banks, and uh, the banks have been forgiven and they've, moved, they've been allowed to move on. Thank you, Deputy. Mr. Brett, would you like to conclude? Any well, I suppose, look, just to thank your committee, first of all, for inviting us in. I think it's a huge importance for my sector uh, you know, to set out uh, that we do, want, we do want to participate. We, act, we keenly await the, your recommendations and I look forward to engaging again uh, in due course w when we get that. And I want to re reiterate the piece in terms of uh, you know, customers who are in distress. Uh, really, the, the key here is get the, ex get the independent advice and engage. Do not ignore it. does not go away. And finally, if there are recommendations from your committee across the four sectors, we're not here just to talk about mortgages. If there is an opportunity in social housing, in affordable housing, in the, in the rented sector, or in the owner sector, uh, we, act, we actively want to, want to try and engage and be constructive in, for matters that are within the competence and remit of the banking sector. And I suppose, um, you know, finally, if, if, I leave no, if I leave you with nothing else, uh, you know, clearly whatever interventions are made, every one of them, they need to be coordinated and they need to be stress tested for un, unintended consequences. Many people will com come and have all sorts of recommendations. They all look good, but you need to look at them in the, in the round and you need to stress test them for un unintended consequences. And what we mustn't do is, pure, is just drive up the house prices and drive up indebtedness. That does not serve this economy and it does not serve families. So I would really make a, you know, make, make, by way of concluding, saying we actively want to participate um, and I would urge you to try and make sure that any recommendations that, you, that are put forward are stress tested and there's somebody in charge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Federation for their attendance today, Mr O'Regan, Mr Brett, Mr Crowley, uh, for the documentation and the follow-up information that will come in due course. Thank you for your attendance. We'll suspend for a moment to uh, allow the next group in. Thank you.
good afternoon and I'm pleased uh, to welcome um, the League of Credit Unions represented this afternoon by Mr Ed Farrell and Mr John Knox. Uh, your documentation has been uh, received and circulated so the members have it uh, but uh, you would like to start with uh, an opening statement please. Okay, thank you Deputy and Mr Chairman members of the committee I'm grateful to you all for inviting the Irish League of Credit Unions to make a presentation to the members on the social housing funding proposal that um, the, the League of Credit Unions has produced. I'm joined today by John Knox from our Research and Development Department. Um, as you'll be aware, the Irish League of Credit Unions represents 423 credit unions across the island of Ireland. Um, we have 3.4 million members, member savings of about 13 billion euros and about 15 billion euros in assets. As the committee is aware, credit unions are a voluntary visionary movement. Members own and run credit unions. Being a grassroots, not-for-profit organisation founded and run for a social purpose, credit unions are a unique financial institution. Democratically run, volunteer-led and based on helping members and not profiting from customers, our ethos sets us apart. The economic crash has put enormous pressure on families and credit unions have been there for them and now we want to do more. Focusing on the future, in a national and global financial environment which technologically and structurally will be radically different to what went before. Our purpose is to demonstrate how credit unions can better serve communities. To that end, the League has in its policy platform set out six strategic steps on how in partnership with government and the central bank we can deliver on a range of critical issues including social housing. One such step on micro lending for the most vulnerable in partnership with the Department of Social Protection is now operating very successfully as a pilot scheme. I mention this to underline the readiness and willingness of the credit union movement to respond and to take action. On the 15th of November last, on, on International Credit Union Day, the League published the detailed document which is before you on our, our social housing strategy. Our proposal was published specifically in response to the publication in November 2014 by the Government of its Social Housing Strategy 2020 and this included a number of key themes including that the State adopts a central role in the direct provision of social housing through a resumption of building on a significant scale and the funding of this programme will require the development of innovative funding mechanisms that do not increase the general government debt that is there to be financially sustainable. Our proposition is broadly as follows. The credit union movement would form a special purpose vehicle that would either invest in a state-owned financial vehicle which would on-lend to the approved housing bodies to fund the development of social housing or to invest and on-lend directly to the approved housing bodies to fund the development of the social housing. The key benefit arising from the credit union movement from this proposition would be that it would enable the movement to put a significant portion of the members' funds of 8.5 billion euros, which are currently largely held in short-term investments, to a more productive and economically rewarding purpose, while at the same time addressing a key social issue that deeply affects the communities in which credit unions serve. This would represent an initiative that would be very closely aligned to the core values of the credit union movement economic democracy, inclusiveness, human and social development, community focus, etc. The key benefit for the State for this proposition would be that it would enable the government strategy of off-balance sheet sustainability to be fulfilled over short, medium and long-term horizons. Credit unions could become a significant funder of the social housing strategy via the approved housing bodies and reduce the financial commitments of the State to the social housing agenda while enabling the government to retain complete control over social housing policy. The proposed mechanism developed in the, developed in the League's proposal sets out a structure by which the Irish credit union movement could fund approved housing bodies to provide social housing. The approved housing bodies provide and manage social rented housing. They are private not-for-profit organisations formed for the purpose of relieving housing need. There are approximately 520 approved housing bodies in Ireland with a stock size of over 27,000 units. Approximately 10% of the approved housing bodies provide 80% of the housing supply, so therefore there are 
small number of well-established and financially sound approved housing bodies who provide the vast majority of the social housing needs. This would also have a wider economic impact. The initiation of social housing projects would create employment, generate taxes, provide stimulus to the construction sector, etc. The key benefits for the population as a whole are obvious, the creation of a sustainable supply of social housing opportunities for those in need. I want to emphasise in the context of our discussion today that credit unions responded in response to a call from government. The League's proposal has been the subject of detailed discussion between us and the Departments of Finance and Environment, Community and Local Government, as well as the Central Bank. Indeed, there have been a number of meetings at official level in the past weeks, and I want to acknowledge the consideration given by officials and the interest and support given by all sides politically. Regrettably, however, today we are no further on. Innovative funding models have not been delivered on. We as credit unions are willing and ready. There is a lot of genuine interest both within government departments and politically. There has been a lot of in-depth consideration. The next step we are looking for is to bring this proposal forward together with government. We remain willing partners. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Farrell. A number of people uh, have indicated that they have questions, but just on one technical point, uh, you mentioned it's an off-balance sheet in relation to the housing bodies. I presume by that if the funding were made available to local government, it would not be off-balance sheet. Is that the, the, the key point? Arrangement. Yes, yeah, public payment partnership. I take it, as I say, we, we were following through from the social housing strategy document where the approved housing body where the, where the, was, was the favoured um, entity being empowered. So I, I would assume that the lending to an arm of the state would, if it was directly anyway, if, I mean, if there are indirect ways of, of doing it, that the financial vehicle, the state financial vehicle, which was the, the first option, I suppose, which is in the the social housing strategy paper, that, that was to be created if it could be kept off the government state balance sheet. Our understanding of late from the Department of Environment is that they, they're not going to be able or, or certainly not yet been able to construct that in a way that it will be off balance sheet. Thank you. With, uh, Deputy Ryan. Just a quick one. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Mr. Yeah, take a number of questions maybe yeah. together first. Uh, Mr. Farrell, in relation to uh, the possibility of you getting into this area. My understanding is the central bank as your regulator is uh, a problem for you. And when this was, matter was raised with the Minister for Finance earlier, certainly he referred to the central bank as being some form of barrier to you in, uh, getting into this area. So could you tell us wh what discussions you've had with your own regulator uh, and what your response to that might be? Thank you. Deputy Durkin. Yeah. Uh, the, the sad part, uh, uh, Chairman, you, you, you'll be sorry to hear, there's the, the word, the, the, the mention again of, of the house, uh, approved housing bodies, whom I regard as the cause of the housing crisis, essentially, in the sense that the reliance on the, 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 the approved housing bodies is what has left the local authority as uh, social housing, for want of a better description now it's called, uh, the way it is. And I cannot for the life of me understand why some effort does not be made. And I welcome the, 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 the submission from the League of Credit Unions. But it means nothing because we're proceeding down the same course we were there for the last 10 years and it's solving nothing. So the question... Point to what, have you a question? Well, I have a question, of course. And I, 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 it should be obvious at this stage. To what extent... To what, to, and the, this applies to all the wise people as well. Uh, 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 the, the, to what extent have you examined the, the prospect of entry into a public-private partnership with the local authorities who have direct responsibility for, for providing local authority housing? Have you thought of the possibility of perhaps reintroducing what used to be provided funded by the local loans fund through the local authorities, whereby people could get a local authority loan, where uh, first-time buyers like, like junior civil servants, local authority workers, anybody, public and private sector, were able to get a local authority loan uh, directly, and thereby providing themselves with a house by means of their own independently and, and with the help of the local authority and the Irish League of Credit Unions and for God's sake could we get away from this reliance on, on, on approved housing bodies who have a specialty, a niche which they are best at and that is, as I have often said, in the special housing requirement areas. 
Deputy O'Brien. Thanks very much, Chair, and, and thanks to Ed and uh, John for the presentation. Just first of all, I suppose, to express some frustration, uh, which I'm sure you the Irish League of Credit Unions feels that having made, I think, what's actually a really important proposal last year, we're still sitting here and, and waiting for formal government response. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, and say that I share the frustration. A couple of kind of very specific questions, um, and it's in the context of strongly welcoming the proposal that the that ILCU have made. The first thing is, obviously, while you've been engaged in discussions with the department, I'm wondering uh, if you have considered uh, or pursued the possibility uh, of pursuing parallel discussions with a local authority and an approved housing body to pilot the kind of scheme that you're talking about. So, for example, notwithstanding Deputy Durkin's comments about approved housing bodies, there are local authorities, Dublin City, South Dublin, that have very significant tracts of land, uh, but they don't have the cash to build, and they don't have the cash to build because central government won't give it to them or won't allow them to borrow. But they could bring the land to the table. Ilku could bring the finance and an approved housing body in conjunction with the local authority uh, could then provide the vehicle for you to fund uh, and we could get a significant output of houses. And I'm just wondering, that might be a way of demonstrating to the Department of Environment and to um, the central bank that it's a viable project. And if you want a couple of suggestions of land and uh, local authorities, I'm happy to provide them to you afterwards. The second thing is, I, I know you're not going to be able to tell us your real thoughts on this, but I'm interested to know what you think are the barriers, either from the Department of Environment officials or indeed for the central bank, as to why this proposal hasn't gone anywhere as yet. Social housing strategy was launched the October before last. The type of proposal that you're making is exactly in line with what the government told us they were going to do. So I'm just, I'm at a loss. Maybe you can shed some light on it as to, as to why this hasn't uh, uh, progressed. Um, and then the last thing is, there, there is a possible way of providing funding to local authorities that would be off balance sheet. It would require the local authorities to set up housing trusts of their own. They wouldn't be approved housing bodies. They would be municipal building corporations, but they would have to be arm's length companies as local authorities run with, with um, uh, uh, leisure centres, etc. I just think that's maybe another avenue that might be worth exploring. And again, if you haven't, there are some local authorities who are very interested in that, then we could point you in their direction. Thank you, Deputy O'Brien. I'll take one more question at this stage. Deputy Cowan. Thank you. And like previous speakers, welcome Ed and John to today's meeting. And, can, and, and agree with the previous speaker. And, 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 you know, one simple solution is the setting up of housing associations, whether by local authorities or local communities. That gets around it. I just, I, I, haven't a, I haven't a question as such, but I have a statement to make. It, it's one of great disappointment again to hear that I'm full of a call by government uh, on launching its strategy almost two years ago, and having responded to it positively, and having uh, proposed a means and a way by which you could release a lot of much-needed capital into the market place in order to solve a social issue for which your company was, your your, your society and league was set up in the first instance, done great work and, and been of great assistance when many others haven't. And I find it very disappointing, annoying, and uh, that no progress has been made by the parties that you've been in discussion and negotiation with. We've been talking about a crisis that exists out there. It's now an emergency. And, you know, the, the, the famed arrangement and documents associated with the arrangement we've entered into with the government lead government party who expects to lead a government in the coming weeks We've made it plain and clear uh, that we expect and want to see a role by the credit unions in this area. And I would hope that this committee uh, reinforces that wish on the part of those that we represent, because the, 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 um, the areas for which uh, we have relied on in the past for dealing with this crisis are not capable, it would appear, uh, in their totality. Uh, to meet the demands that are there and outside um, help and assistance of this nature is greatly appreciated and I would hope that any barrier, whatever they may be, that they be taken down as soon as is humanly possible and allow uh, this intervention have the desired effect. Thank you, Deputy. The questions all relate around, are similar, but in your reply, you, in your opening statement, you indicated you had these discussions and you clearly say you're no further on. You might try in as much detail as possible to identify what were the actual obstacles, whether with the department or with the 
central bank or, or where, are they, where are the actual blockages are the local authorities? Right, it's a, a history, I suppose. Um, I suppose Deputy Ryan asked about the central bank. The, cent the central bank obviously lays down the rules and regulations that the individual credit unions must follow as part of their business. And I suppose typically credit unions would have taken in money from their local membership, loaned it out in, in typically small, unsecured loans for personal reasons, and then the, the other monies would have been put into investments and deposit accounts. Um, the, the only thing that they can go into is, is government bonds and deposit accounts with, with the banks. And th throughout the last few years, the, the loan demand has declined. So we, we have a build-up, as it were. We have more surplus funds in the individual credit unions than, than we would wish to have, as it were. So that's part of the background to, to there's 8 or 9 billion euro not loaned out. As I said earlier, there's 13 billion in member savings. There's 4 billion of it loaned out. There's 9 billion of it not loaned out largely sitting, earning very little and lying idle, as it were, in um, bank deposit accounts. So the central bank, you know, under our, our paper had two options, as it were. Option one was to um, feed into the state-owned financial vehicle, which was envisaged in the social housing strategy from 2014. And if, if that state-owned financial vehicle was a runner on the on-off balance sheet debate that we referenced there earlier, our, our money in that would have had a, a state guarantee and it probably would have been compliant with those rules and regulations because it would be a government, like a government bond almost. Now that it's become more obvious since um, late last year and, and earlier this year that that state-owned financial vehicle isn't going to get the, the, the off-balance sheet blessing as it were, it's our option too or it's our indirect model which has, has become the focus of the discussions with the, the two departments and with the central bank and because it it, it isn't, I suppose, being explicitly guaranteed by the state. It doesn't fulfil the current rules and regulations that the central bank lay down. It's not a government bond. It's not a deposit account. Although the repayment of the loan back by the approved housing body to the credit unions, the repayment of it is quasi-guaranteed because the, the lease agreement between the, the, the housing body and the local authority you know, is an arm of the state, so the repayment almost is guaranteed, the loan isn't. So we are trying to work with the central bank that they might tweak the rules and regulations on our investments, which really aren't investments, they're just monies part in deposit accounts, they're not invested in property or anything like that, to, to allow us move maybe one billion of that nine or ten billion. We're not looking to move all of our members' money from a current provider to a a local um, approved housing body. So that, that's the, the discussions that we're now having with the central bank, and that's un, in the indirect model, which only became obvious, I suppose, um, late last year, earlier this year. I suppose to be fair to the central bank, they did include reference to social housing in their CP88, which was a, a, a new draft of the rules and regulations, which was doing the rounds last year, and, and ultimately after a six-month delay and a lot of a lot of um, toing and froing between the credit union movement and the central bank and, and people like yourselves, that became law on the 1st of January. And to be fair, they did make reference that social housing may become part of the package of credit union's investments, but we still have to get that across the line. And all these things, I suppose, take longer than, than all of us might, might like. Um, back on, on Deputy Durkin, I suppose we've been focusing on the group housing bodies because that's where the government strategy is focusing. It's not that we pick them because we, we know them or like them any better, but we were trying to fill in. This was the, the call from government, and as I said, there's, there's kind of a, a history of, of meetings and engagements between ourselves and, and various people in the department, and, and that and some of it goes back before, before my, uh, my tenure as CEO. But there's been you know, a, a desire by us to try and propose something that fits in with the government strategy, and for as long as we're doing that, that's, that's the, the page we're on, as it were. If, if that one works and we get that one moving, maybe we can then look at something like the, the public-private partnership, as you're talking about. If this one doesn't get across the line, maybe we can look at that one anyway. So, I mean, we're not ruling anyone in or anyone out. We're just trying to kind of dovetail in with what, in 2014, November of 2014, was the stated, I suppose, um, aim of how social housing would, would be delivered 
for the next five or six years, 2020. State with your charge. Sorry, Chairman. Interest rates, we haven't, I mean, we have, we have um, speculated an interest rate of 3.5% in, in, our, in our proposal. I mean, the, the short-term deposits that our credit unions are invested in in the banks are earning 1% and less, and, and that's getting lower by the, by the week and by the month as, as the European Central Bank goes to zero and then goes negative. So, you know, we, we believe the banks will be charging more than that. We're, 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 we'd be confident that we'd be able to come into a middle of a road position that we'd be, um, it'd be better than what we're earning, but wouldn't have to be maybe as commercial as a profit-making bank. We, we're not profit-making as it were, but I mean, um, the T's and C's as it were, we, we haven't got there yet because we haven't, we haven't got the door ajar enough to even go to terms and conditions as it were, but we're not looking. This has been done for, for the social return and the social investment in the, in the communities and the parishes where the credit unions are as much about earning a slightly better return. Yeah. Did you want to just, just, just very quickly related to, the, to the, the, the question I had in relation to the, the regulator? I think it would be important for us to invite in the credit union regulator just to close off this proposal because it seems that's the barrier. And I think it's worthwhile doing that. Thank you. Um, I are you complete? Or well, or Deputy O'Brien, again, the local authorities um, piloting, um, piloting something. I mean, we'd be, I suppose, shy to, to um, pilot or, or do anything unless we'd have the regulatory permission on that. I mean, it's just, it'd be a big step for us or for an individual or a group of individual credit unions, even if it was a pilot basis, if they provide the money against the, the, the wishes or, or the rules, even if the rules are, are going to be changed, it's, it's a big step. But, I mean, if, if we could get indication of, 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 of change coming from the central bank, we could certainly start discussions and be ready for, for when the, you know, to be ready to, to, ready to, to go, as it were. Um, when, you know, I don't think we can go, go ahead of the stuff. The, I mean, the barriers, I suppose, the... the the fact that, I mean, the state-owned financial vehicle would have been, been quicker, and if that was feasible, that would have been the quickest um, route to market, to use that term, for us. The other one is a slightly more roundabout manner, but, you know, because the loans are ultimately, the repayment of the loans are ultimately coming from arms of the state, we, we don't see it as being much more risky. Because of that, it's slightly riskier, because there's, slight, there's more parties involved in, in, in the diagram or in the equation, but you know it's not it's not high risk stuff or anything like that and we wouldn't be um, we wouldn't be here if it was. So certainly we can we can consider, you know, we, the government's document, the government's policy was the approved housing bodies. That's our first, I suppose, preferred route. We'll see how that goes and then we can certainly move to a second one if, if the, the local authority or a, a PPP or as you say, like the way the leisure centres are, are, are leased back or whatnot, that certainly isn't isn't off the agenda. It's just you know our first cut at it is the trying to dovetail in with the the current policy, as it were. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Uh, very briefly, because I have a number of just to, just to come up back on the on the pilot. Um, local authorities wouldn't be willing to do something without the departmental approval either. So I suppose my, my proposal was more. Often, and it's the case as much with the central bank as with the Department of Environment, their reluctance is when they're presented with a big new initiative, mm. possibly convincing them of the merits of that bigger initiative through the development of a pilot might just be one approach to try and ease this, I suppose was my point. Um, we'll come to you in a moment, Mr. Farrell. We'll take a number of contributions. Uh, Deputy Coppinger. Um, yeah, j just to say, I, I think we all had our questions about approved housing bodies and I, I was speaking to the, the credit unions earlier. I, I don't think, well, I certainly don't see the approved housing bodies as being the solution to ending the housing crisis in that they're, you know, too small scale and the resources will be better given to local authorities. But I think it would be a stretch to blame the approved housing bodies for causing the housing crisis. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, no, but it's just that was said, and I, I, I'm about putting that preamble to, to my question because um, I don't want to sound like I'm defending the housing bodies, but 
the the issue of public private partnerships to be honest the cause of the housing crisis is quite clear it's two successive governments if you want to put it that way rather than housing bodies it was an ideological decision taken to pass <clears throat> pass over house building to housing bodies and i don't agree with that i think that they've a minority role rather than the majority role but in relation to <clears throat> the proposal that's there <clears throat> excuse me i mean i i wouldn't be opposed to the proposal in the sense that um, it, if the, the housing bodies are going to be borrowing from a bank, I, they may as well be doing it at a cheaper rate from the credit union who have a better ethos in the sense of, you know, not for profit, for the common good. They give cheap loans to workers. But I, I would just make the point as well. I wouldn't oppose this proposal at all. But that the government has the ability to borrow for 1%. Right, and what's been proposed here is between three and you know four percent, uh, and I've made this point to the to the league, and really we have to be borrowing cheaply and building housing on a major scale rather than you know those small scales. But I certainly wouldn't stand in the way of, of this going ahead. Thank you, um, Deputy O'Sullivan. Um, thank you. Um, Section forty-four of the Credit Union, nineteen ninety-seven Credit Union Act. Minister Noonan was suggesting that there was a potential there f to use that to develop social housing. And I was just wondering, have you thought of that one? And my second question is your relationship with dormant accounts. You are excluded from that, is my understanding. And do you see any um, merit in being included, seeing as how there could be cap seed capital there for social housing? Thanks. Uh, Deputy Wallace. Yeah, uh, just... On, on the issue of PPPs, uh, you, the credit union rate of 3.5% would be very attractive in comparison to 50, about 15% of the often the PPPs come in at. Uh, this morning, Minister for Finance uh, said he, here that we can't have credit unions engaging in risky lending. Now, whether he thinks that the banks can and, and doesn't like use doing it, uh, I just wonder what you think of that. And, and just ask, I'd like to know if you think you're facing, I mean, you are facing uh, barriers in the area of lending. Uh, in how you're restricted. Uh, would you say you're more restricted by the central bank regulator or by government thinking? And finally in this section, um, Deputy Rabbit. Thank you very much and thank you both earlier on for giving us the presentation. As a newly elected deputy, I find it unbelievable to think since 2014 that we're still having this conversation that a grouping of people have come and have offered money to help us out with a, a housing crisis and a year and a half later on we don't seem to have got we haven't squared that circle at all it's hard to believe so just to be clear you're coming offering eight billion towards housing is that correct or not correct i need to engage in a conversation here if you don't mind for a second just for my own if that's okay chairman um, ed did, are you coming offering eight billion towards housing not, not, not all eight billion. We have, we have eight or nine billion in surplus funds, not right. loaned out. So we have, we have shown um, scenarios where the, the, the strategy again talks about thirty-five thousand new housing units being built, and if that, and the preferred provider being the approved housing body. So we have shown if the approved housing bodies build a quarter of them, or build a half of them, or build three quarters of them, that would mean one billion, or two billion, or three billion. From so you're us. coming offering money towards building houses? Yeah, lo All right. loan, yeah, money that would have to be repaid. Oh, yeah, absolutely, no, no, absolutely. Finance, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. that answers um, yeah, somebody no, no. in the video. But, it, but it's um, important question, to say that you're yeah. coming with funds, all yeah. right? And what, what the, then my understanding is, the restriction of you using this funds, more than likely, is the, your memos and understanding of the regulatory body, which is the central bank, as to how your funds, because of the makeup of a credit union, is that correct? Yes, for, for the, now that it seems that the state owned, so now that it seems that the preferred option on this off balance sheet isn't going to satisfy the people that do the government on balance sheet rules, we then need the regulator to change the rules. Yes. All right. For you still to invest in supporting building to, of houses? To ultimately lend it to an approved housing body, which is a not for profit. 
builder yes. of social housing, like a credit union, is a little bit like a very small not-for-profit bank, as it were. Yes. Now, yes. Th that's going to bring me straight along to the next one, because I think you're hitting too many roadblocks, to be quite honest with you. You've had a government roadblock, you've had a central bank roadblock and everything else. And at your opening statement earlier on, you said you have 13 billion in savings and 15 billion in assets. Is that correct? Why not grow the assets? Why not let the credit union build the houses themselves? Can you do that? Certainly not at the current rules. If we can't lend to, all, uh, to an approved housing body, right. no, we can. When a credit union, when, when, a, when a man or woman or child walks in off the street to join the credit union and lodge their, their savings, their hard earned earnings as savings, the credit union traditionally would have loaned out 70 or 80 percent of that to the the needs of the local people. That's why credit unions were still up in the 50s when credit wasn't available and, you, you know, 50 no. years later. So if, you do, if the credit unions couldn't lend it to the people in the parish or in the community or in the factory, depending on the common bond, it then had to be put, surplus funds put into the bank. And when credit unions were, were well lent at 60 and 70 percent of their balance sheets, that was, that was just put on current accounts or on deposit. The rules then tweaked that and, and made sure, I suppose, in the good times, that credit unions couldn't go into house building or anything like that. Not saying we would have, but that's where the restriction or, or the, the very tight rules on the other monies come from. But when you would have had large build, build up of savings mm. and you walked into a local bank then mm. to invest that money, be it for a three month, six month, twelve month, whatever, you, you are allowed to invest. Was that just cash investment or could you have done it in different sort of bond investments? And that bond could have been um, be it property, be it equity or whatever. Were you tied up in as to how you were allowed to invest that money? Deposits is the preference, I suppose, for the central bank, but they are allowed to put some of it in a bond if the bond is fully guaranteed by the bank. So it's almost the same as a deposit. They wouldn't have been allowed by the type of bonds that, that mightn't get repaid. Now, in theory, if the banks, the banks went under the bonds, no more than what happened, but thankfully the banks got guaranteed. So all the credit union money that was typically in the Irish banks was okay because of that. But we can't buy equities or, or you know, shares in the banks. It's, it's deposits or guaranteed bonds, which are almost like deposits. They would have a fixed maturity and you're guaranteed your money back. So the idea is, you know, it's, credit unions aren't, you know, designed or, or set up, I suppose, to take risky lending or risky investing decisions. And we're comfortable that we don't do the risky stuff, but we don't count this as anyway risky because well, no, not the, not when you have the 15 government, billion and 13. No, not the government repayment. The difference in the 13 to 15 is we have built up reserves of 2 billion, so that's the difference. So we have 2 billion of retained surpluses built up as our capital, so we have a 15 or 16 percent overall capital. It needs to be 10 percent on the central bank rules, but we actually have 15 or 16 percent. So we, we have plenty of a cushion or a buffer, even if you know, one of the loans did go wrong, there's plenty of a cushion there, although we don't see it as something that could go wrong in the current design of how the social housing model works. My last question to you is, is, this is the real question is, what can we do then to help you spend your money from this committee meeting here? What, what is the roadblock? What, what is the recommendation you would like us as a committee to go forward with to actually access the cash to put it back into the communities that have invested in you because you're willing to come forward. Because we've had the Banking Federation in earlier on and they didn't offer us any money, but you're sitting there and there is an access to funds. We'd like, I suppose, to see the, the two departments, Environment and Finance and the Central Bank, to try and figure out quickly how this can be facilitated. So we're, we're responding to, a, to an official proposal or strategy where credit unions were mentioned on, on page 33 we, and, and John would have been at more of the meetings in the department. We, we were engaging with the Department of Environment before that report came out and, and lots since and we, we then were told, well look, you're there on page 33 to, to further it and, and get some speed behind it. Draw up your own proper written formal proposals. There's the two options as it were and we're just, I suppose, surprised or disappointed with the, the, the I suppose there's arms of the state, the two departments, the central bank, and it's a massive problem and 
maybe we were naive or that, but we just felt it would happen quicker. But they're the people, I suppose. And to be fair, we've had meetings with the departments in the last two weeks, two months, um, even during the, the, the election time and that. And we, we had a central bank meeting earlier in the year and we have went, went back to them with further information and we believe the three of them are going to get together to try and hopefully map out a road plan for us. Great. Earl, there were other issues raised by Deputy O'Sullivan and Wallace, if you'd like to refer to those. John or, maybe yes. in for a while. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, well, just to finish off, I suppose, in terms of the engagement with the departments, we've had a very constructive engagement with the Department of the Environment, and, and they've confirmed that our proposal slots in to an existing model that they use. I know we've debated the merits of the model they use, but the, in terms of funding the housing bodies and private finance, they've confirmed that our model ticks all the boxes and fits in with their proposal. So we've had very constructive meetings with them. Deputy Wallace raised a thing about risky lending, and I, I think Ed has already touched on it. We don't see this as, as, as risky lending. We, we would not be proposing this proposal if we thought it was going to put Credit Union's funds and Credit Union members' funds, more importantly, at risk. Um, the ultimate counterparty to these loans is the state. The, the, the way the housing bodies repay these loans is via um, an income or rental income stream they receive, which is underwritten by the Department of the Environment. So in terms of risk and lending, we would see the counterparty being the state as, as removing that risk. Um, for the barriers for central bank, obviously their question centres on the risk, and that's where the toing and froing um, with the central bank has been. In the first instance, we would have met with the Department of the Environment, as we said, to ensure that our proposal was accurate and, and, and fitted the policy. Once we had completed our interaction with them, we then met with the central bank in January of this year. So it's in the intervening months, um, as one would expect, the central bank, it, it's quite clearly stated their role is ultimately, the Registry of Credit Union's role is to protect the savings of Credit Union members. So they're focused very much on the risk, and it's now what we're trying to do is endeavour to allay any concerns they may have and thankfully, as Ed has outlined in, in recent meetings with the two departments, they've also offered that they will try and meet with the central bank to give them any further information in terms of how this model would work and, and allay any fears and concerns they may have about risk, which would finally enable them to make the regulatory changes so that we could progress this thing once for all. And just on section 4 and 4 of the Act of Deputy Sullivan raised, that, that, that's a section that an individual credit union can create out of its own money, so it, you know, it wouldn't be a loan. A little fund and they can sponsor the local teams, the local school, but it wouldn't be a loan that you'd be getting back. It'd be helping the community um, initiatives, so it'd be more like a, a charitable thing. It wouldn't be um, the scale of it. I think you're only allowed 2% or something into it, so even the scale of it, even if you could lend it, it wouldn't be anywhere big enough, but it's more to do with credit union sponsoring local initiatives and bursaries and that sort of stuff. <coughs> and the same with the dormant accounts, I suppose. I mean, if it's handed back, it's handed back. If it's not handed back, it's kept for the people whose names is on those accounts or their next of kin. So again, it, it wouldn't be meant to be used for something else. I mean, it's there. Somebody lodged that money and credit unions would would go along on hard to try and find the, the rightful owner or the next of kin and monies in credit unions is insured so when, if you lodge a hundred euro to a credit union and if god forbid that happens you generally that money is then doubled up the money is actually insured with a with another arm of the leagues and again if you had a loan and you passed away your loan is repaid out of that insurance so again families and credit unions go a long way to make sure whoever is is entitled to that money even after a debt gets back that money because it's it's too hard earned as it were to be, to be handing it over whether no, no matter who you're to hand it over to you know okay Any, sorry deputy uh, yeah, th thanks just a, a kind of a practical um suggestion because obviously you can hear there's quite a lot of of sympathy for ilku's position in all of this i mean if i understand you right and you're saying really the key problem here is the central bank and the re credit unions regulator in terms of the rules they're imposing on you if you have specific recommendations that you'd like to submit to the committee by email of to changes either to the investment regulations or to any other aspect of that, uh, that could be very helpful for us in terms of concrete recommendations. So just to maybe invite you to, to have a think about that and send us back something on directly. That's easy, 
Yeah, we have, we know, or we think we know exactly the wording, yes. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Is everybody happy at this stage? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Farrell, any concluding remarks? No, well, just as I said to start, we appreciate um, the committee's, I suppose, attention on, on the, 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 the matter and the invite to ourselves, because it is something that credit unions, I suppose, feel strongly about, because it is a, a need in, in almost every parish and every community, and that they know the people, I suppose, who are coming in the doors every week who are, who are challenged with, with their homes and with their houses, so it is something that we have... Um, we don't always agree on all things, but this is certainly one one um, project or one initiative that, that I think practically every credit union is is very happy that all of us are trying to engage on it. So thank yourselves, and, and, and I suppose the best of luck. You have, you have a tough tough job here at this committee with, with a, as I say, an ever increasing complex problem. I think. Well, thank you very much for your attendance today, Mr. Farrell and Mr. Knox. And to reiterate the point that Deputy O'Brien made, the technical issues that are causing the roadblock you might forward those to the committee. They would be useful for us to consider with uh, other witnesses in the future. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, today's meeting. So we adjourn till next uh, Tuesday, the 10th of May at 10.30 a.m. Thank you very much. <laughs>